Hello YouTube, Dave here again. Welcome to part one of my Xanathar's Guide to Everything week. Uh, so over the course of the next few days, I'm going to be looking at several different aspects of this book. So for the first four days, I'm going to be looking at the brand new class options that are being presented in this book, uh, with Friday's video being a comparison of encounter building using the Dungeon Master's Guide versus the new uh, options presented in this book. Now, uh, initially I was just going to go through and present the classes as they are ordered in Xanathar's Guide to Everything, which is done in the alphabetical order, but honestly I kind of wanted to do these videos around some themes. And I kind of looked at this as uh, wanting to group similar classes together for the purposes of each of these videos. Mainly just because it's a way of presenting them in sort of a different manner um, and makes it maybe a little bit more interesting if you're a fan of a particular type of character. Then, you know, you can get the information that you need from them all in the one video. And I thought that I would actually kind of group these together more or less in a manner similar to how classes were um, divided in 4th edition Dungeons & Dungeons and Dragons and in a much similar or smaller capacity uh, going back to 3rd edition D&D when they had their supplement books for like their soft cover ones. Uh, so today I'm going to be looking at the primal characters or uh, I think I'm going to call this one uh, Forces of Nature or if you're thinking of like the old D&D 3rd edition stuff, Masters of the Wild. So in this video I'm going to be looking at the Barbarian, uh, the Druid, and the Ranger. So the classes that work best or have the strongest connection to uh, nature. So that's going to be what I'm looking at today. Tomorrow's video I'm going to be looking at uh, Champions of the Divine. So I'm going to be looking at clerics, I'm going to be looking at uh, paladins, and simply because of the way that they're done, uh, and especially the options that are presented in Xanathar's Guide to Everything, I'm going to be including the Warlock in that particular video. Uh, the next one is after that is going to be um, focusing on like the more martial-oriented classes, uh, which would be the monk, uh, the fighter, and uh, the thief. And then finally, I'm going to be looking at the arcane classes being the bard, uh, the sorcerer, and the wizard. So, like I said, today we're going to be looking at our primal characters, our champions, or nature's wrath, if you will. So we're going to be taking a look at the barbarian, the druid, and the ranger, and we're going to start off with the barbarian class. So with the Barbarian, uh, the first thing I just kind of want to draw attention to are sort of just the optional um, features here, like the personal totems and the tattoos. These are just things that you can use to sort of flesh out your, your character, give it some uh, physical characteristics as well as something that you have with it. Um, like the personal totems, for example, I kind of like there's like the first one is a tuft of fur from a solitary wolf that you befriended during a hunt. Uh, three eagle feathers given to you by a wise shaman who told you they would play a role in determining your fate, which could make for an interesting plot device if the DM wanted to, to frame those in there. Uh, another personal totem is a necklace made from the claws of a young cave bear that you slew single-handedly as a child. Uh, so that's pretty interesting as well. Again, gives you some background stuff. Uh, a small leather pouch holding three stones that represent your ancestors, which may work well with one of the primal paths that we're going to be looking at here shortly. Uh, a few small bones from the first beast that you killed and tied together with colored wool. And the last one is just an egg-shaped stone, uh, egg-sized stone, sorry, in the shape of your spirit animal that appeared uh, one day in your pouch, or in your belt pouch. So that works more or less with some of the, the options presented in the, uh, the player's handbook. Uh, the tattoos, um, they're just sort of, you know, animal markings. I'm not going to really go into detail on them, but if you, if you want to look at them, I'll just uh, bring them up here. And you can pause the video to read what those ones are. The flavor elements that they added to the Barbarian that I really like are the superstitions. Uh, I just think they're really cool and make for some great role-playing opportunities. So the first uh, superstition is if you disturb the bones of the dead, you inherit all the troubles that plagued them in life, which is pretty neat. Uh, never trust a wizard. They're all devils in disguise, especially the friendly ones. I think that one has a lot of potential uh, to role-play out, especially if there's a uh, wizard in the party. Uh, this is here, the third one, dwarves have lost their spirits and are almost like the undead, that's why they live underground. Definitely not one for a dwarf, although yes, you could have a dwarf one that's sort of, um, 
uh, I don't want to say a self-hating dwarf, but it could make for an interesting role-playing thing there. Uh, magical things bring trouble. Never sleep with a magic object within 10 feet of you. Uh, the fifth one is when you walk through a graveyard, be sure to wear silver or a ghost may jump into your body. And then the last one is if an elf looks you in the eyes, she's trying to read your thoughts. So I just think that those are kind of cool options. I, I like those quite a bit. And um, uh, I, I just think it adds for some really cool role-playing features. But what I want to really want to get into here are the different paths. So we've got the first one is the path of the ancestral guardian. And so basically, the premise of the Path of the Ancestral Guardian is um, the, it's a barbarian tribe that venerates their dead and, you know, the spirits of their ancestors, and they believe that these spirits can empower you and protect you, and that's sort of what these, uh, the class features for this do. Uh, do. So, starting off, uh, at oh, your first abilities that you get is at third level you get Ancestral Protectors, uh, so, starting when you choose this path, uh, Spectral Warriors appear when you enter a rage. While you're raging, the first creature you hit with an attack on your turn becomes the target of the Warriors, which hinder its attacks. Until the start of your next turn, that target has disadvantage on any attack roll that isn't against you. And, the t and when the target hits a creature other than you with an attack, that creature has resistance to the damage dealt by the attack. The effect on the target ends early if, you're, if your rage ends. Uh, so again, just sort of a way of drawing the uh, creatures to attack the Barbarian and not other party members. Uh, so given like the Barbarian's high hit points, it's usually a good way to, uh, to keep the rest of the player characters alive. At 6th level, they get Spirit Shield, so the Guardian spirits that aid you can provide supernatural protection to those you defend. If you are raging and another creature you see within 30 feet of you takes damage, you can use your reaction to reduce that damage by 2d6. Uh, when you reach certain levels in this class, you can reduce the damage by more. So, uh, you can reduce the damage by 3d6 at 10th level and 4d6 at 14th level. At 10th level, you get Consult the Spirits. Uh, so you gain the ability to consult with your Ancestral Spirits. When you do, you can cast the Augury or Clairvoyant spell without using a spell slot or material components. Rather than creating a spherical sensor, the, this use of Clairvoyance invisibly summons one of your Ancestral Spirits to the chosen location. Wisdom is your spell casting ability for these spells. After you cast either spell this way, you can't use this feature again until you finish a short or long rest. Uh, so just a good way to sort of learn about your surroundings. I like, I don't mind that ability too much. And then we have uh, the last ability is Vengeful Ancestors. So starting at 14th level, your ancestral spirits grow more powerful uh, enough to, or so they grow powerful enough to retaliate. When you use your spirit shield to reduce the damage of an attack, the attacker takes an amount of force damage equal uh, to the damage your spirit shield uh, prevents. So let's just say you prevent 12 damage with the spirit shield. Uh, the target that hit and you know did the damage that was reduced would take uh, 12 force damage uh, in retaliation. So the this one I think works really well, uh, especially if you're running uh, Eberron. I want to say it's the uh, Aranel Elves, but there is a tribe of elves in, elves in Eberron uh, that their ancestors are living spirits that basically they communed with them and some of them even achieved undead uh, status just so that they can continue to um, benefit the uh, the clan so I think a barbarian from there would definitely want to take this one especially from a flavor perspective uh, this one isn't that bad actually I kind of uh, on second glance I don't mind this one as much it actually seems like a pretty cool uh, idea and I think even dwarven barbarians uh, would benefit greatly since they tend to, um, you know, venerate and reach out to their ancestors as well. So that's all right. So the second path that we're going to look at is the path of the Storm Herald. Uh, so basically, what this one is, you they kind of take on like the the mantle of primal magic, which swirls around them. When in a fury, a barbarian of this path taps into the forces of nature to create powerful magical effects. Uh, Storm Heralds are typically elite champions who train along druid, or alongside druids or rangers and others sworn to protect nature. Uh, other Storm Heralds hone their craft in lodges and regions racked by storms, in the frozen reaches at the world's end or, in the deep, uh, or deep in the hottest of uh, deserts. So this, uh, this path essentially uses um, terrain types 
and you gain different abilities based off of uh, the train type that you choose to uh, to embody. So these are the, the chart there that you get. Uh, so starting at third level, with Storm Aura, uh, you emanate a stormy magical aura while you rage. The aura extends 10 feet out from you in any direction, but not through total cover. Uh, your aura has an effect that activates when you enter your rage, and you can activate the effect again on each of your turns as a bonus action. So you get it for free when you enter your rage, but if you want to make use of the feature while you're raging, you do have to give up your bonus action. Uh, your aura's benefit depends on the chosen environment, as detailed below, and you can change your environmental choice whenever you gain a level in this class. Um, so you would start off with one, and when you gain your next level, like let's just say you chose uh, Desert, um, when you gain another level, if you find that you're not getting a lot of use out of your Desert feature, then you can change it to Sea or Tundra, and any time you gain a level, um, you can uh, change the choice therein. Now, until you gain that next level, you are locked in, so just keep that in mind when you uh, make your initial choice. And the, uh, the ore's effect if they require a saving throw, uh, it's pretty standard. It starts at DC of eight plus your proficiency bonus plus your constitution modifier. So the first option is desert. Uh, when, you, uh, when this effect is activated, all other creatures in the aura take two fire damage. The damage increases when you reach certain levels in this class, so increasing to three at fifth. Uh, 4 at 10th, 5 at 15th, and 6 damage at 20th. Now this is just straight damage, they take it. Uh, no saving throw uh, allowed or required. And you can do this uh, as a bonus action every turn. So you can deal like uh, automatic damage to everything within uh, 10 feet of you. Uh, if you choose C, when this effect is activated, you can choose one other creature you can see in the aura. Uh, that target takes 1d6 lightning damage on a failed save, or half as much on a successful one. And then the damage increases to 2d6 at 10th level, 3d6 at 15th level, and 4d6 at 20th. So this one allows a saving throw, but deals potentially uh, more damage, uh, but only to a single target. And then the last feature is Tundra, or the last option is Tundra. When this effect is activated, each creature of your choice within the aura gains two temporary hit points as icy spirits inure it to suffering. Uh, the temporary hit points increase when you reach certain levels in the class, so increases to 3 at 5th level, 4 at 10th, 5 at 15th, and 6 at 20th. So the Tundra is the defensive option that you can use um, to uh, affect any number of creatures in your aura. So this is something you obviously probably want to have on your fellow party members. Uh, at 6th level, they get Storm Soul, so the Storm grants you benefits even when your aura isn't active. Uh, the benefits are based on the environment you chose for your storm aura. So this would continue along. So if you chose desert, for example, just using the top one for your storm aura, then you would gain the effects of the uh, the desert feature for this uh, until you gain a level and decide to change it. So that's basically how that works. So with, uh, with this, if you chose desert for your storm aura, you gain resistance to fire damage and you don't suffer the effects of extreme heat as described in the Dungeons Master Guide. Uh, as an action, you can touch a flammable object that isn't being worn or carried by someone else, and you can set it on fire. If you chose C for your Storm Aura, you gain resistance to lightning damage and can breathe underwater. Also, you gain a swimming speed of 30 feet. And then if you had chosen Tundra, you gain resistance to cold damage, and you don't suffer the effects of extreme cold, as described in the Dungeon Master's Guide. Moreover, as an action, you can touch water and turn a five-foot cube of it into ice, which melts after one minute. Uh, this action fails if a creature is in the cube. So you can actually make a big uh, cube of ice, which is pretty neat. And then at 10th level, uh, you gain Shielding Storm. So at 10th level, you learn to use your mastery of the storm to protect others. Each creature of your choice that has the damage resistance you gain from your storm soul feature uh, while uh, the creature, or sorry, uh, each creature of your choice has the damage resistance you gained from the storm soul feature while the creature is in your storm aura. So uh, while the storm aura is activated, uh, other creatures gain the benefits of your uh, storm soul. So that's a, a good way of giving them res uh, resistances, things as well. And then lastly, at 14th level, you gain Raging Storm. So at 14th level, the power of the storm you channel grows mightier, lashing at your foes. The effect is based on the environment you chose for your storm aura. So again, everything is sort of tied to that um, that you 
that environment that you chose, desert, sea, or tundra, <clears throat> and it stays that way until you decide to change it. However, uh, so with Raging Storm, if you had the Desert Storm aura, immediately after a creature in your aura hits you with an attack, you can use your reaction to force that creature to make a dexterity saving throw. On a failed save, the creature takes damage equal to half your barbarian level. So it's a way of basically lashing back at them if they hit you. Uh, with C, uh, when you hit a creature in your aura with an attack, you can use your reaction to force that creature to make a strength saving throw. On a failed save, the creature is knocked prone as if struck by a wave. So no damage, but you do knock them prone, guaranteeing advantage on anybody attacking them. And then uh, Tundra, whenever, you, or whenever the effect of your storm aura is activated, you can choose one creature you can see in the aura. That creature must succeed a strength saving throw or its speed is reduced to zero until the start of your next turn as Magical Frost covers it. <clears throat> so again, two pretty interesting ways of using environmental choices uh, to, uh, you know, aff 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 afflict the creature with condition effects, uh, to deal damage to them, and even uh, gain some defensive features as well. Uh, I like, I don't mind this path, this is actually kind of a decent uh, path. The only thing that I don't like about it is the fact that you can change your choices every time you gain a level. Uh, honestly, I would have preferred if you kind of locked it in, so for example, um, you know, once you chose your Storm Aura, uh, all the other features would, would be based off of that one. Um, I, I just think that being able to change it, I know it's only once you level up every time, but I still feel that, you know, you would want to essentially choose an aura that's based off of um, the environment that you were raised in, the environment that you trained in. Uh, so, you know, desert, sea, or tundra would make sense. Um, for that, but just being able to change it. I don't know if I like that necessarily as much, but that's the way that they designed it, so there you go. And now the last uh, feature that we're going to be looking at here today, or the last primal path, is the Path of the Zealot. And it was actually pointed out to me that this one makes uh, a great option for uh, barbarians like the, the Eye of Grimish or, you know, the Worshippers like that, that actually kind of makes sense for it. Uh, so, uh, I kind of warmed up to this one a little bit more, and this is probably my favorite of the options that are in here. So, we'll just uh, look this over. So, again, this is um, essentially a barbarian who has connected to a deity, and uh, their devotion to that deity, you know, manifests itself in several different ways. So, starting off uh, with Divine Fury. Uh, so, when you choose this primal path at third level, you can channel Divine Fury into your weapon strikes. While you're raging, the first creature you hit on each of your turns with the weapon attack takes extra damage equal to 1d6 uh, plus your barbarian level. The extra damage is necrotic or radiant. Uh, you choose the type of damage when you gain this feature. So this is one where you're actually locked in to either radiant or necrotic. Now obviously if you're good aligned, radiant would make sense. And if it's an evil aligned creature, then the necrotic would make more sense. At third level, you also gain a uh, warrior of the gods. Uh, so, at third level, uh, your soul is marked for endless battle. If a spell such as Raise Dead has the sole effect of restoring you to life, but not on death, uh, the caster doesn't need material components to cast a spell on you, which is pretty decent. Uh, at sixth level, you gain Fanatical Focus, uh, so divine power that fuels your rage can protect you. If you fail a saving throw while you're raging, you can re-roll it and you must use the new roll. You can only use this ability uh, once per rage, so it's not something that's going to become super overpowered, but it can uh, save you in a tight spot. Uh, at 10th level you get Zealous Presence. So at 10th level you learn to channel divine power to inspire zealotry in others. As a bonus action you can unleash a battle cry infused with divine energy. Up to 10 other creatures of your choice within 60 feet of you that you can that can see or sorry, that can hear you gain advantage on attack rolls and saving throws until the start of the next turn. Once you use this feature, you can't use it again until you finish a long rest. And then the last one that we have is Rage Beyond Death. So at 14th level, uh, the divine power that fuels your rage allows you to shrug off fatal blows. Uh, so with this, while you're raging, uh, if you're at zero hit points, you don't go unconscious. You can still take your normal actions. Uh, however, you still make your normal death saving throws, and you suffer the normal effects of taking damage while it's your hit points. So each hit uh, is considered to be an automatic failure. Um, 
Uh, however, uh, if you would die due to failing death saving throws, you don't die until your rage ends, and then you only die if you still have zero hit points when you're done your rage. So this, um, that seems to me like a very powerful ability, and I'm not sure that I like the rage beyond death, simply because in 5th edition Dungeons and Dragons, zero hit points is the minimum. There are no negative hit points. Once you're reduced to zero, that's, that's it. So, um where there's no negative hit points. I mean, you only have to be healed a single point uh, of damage in order to actually uh, gain the benefit of this ability. So uh, by the time you're 14th level, you know, your player, character, party members, if you have a cleric, will likely have ways to bring you back from the dead anyway. So I kind of would want to actually track negative hit points personally with this, uh, just where there should be consequences beyond just needing a single point of healing in order to stay alive because again you don't uh, drop into into negatives so uh, again I'm not quite sure how I feel necessarily about that one but it is you know a pretty powerful ability now you're you are 14th level by then so uh, a death isn't a huge hindrance because again you know your cleric uh, party member may have like uh, revivify or things that uh, bring you back from the dead anyway but again I just I think that may be the most overpowered of the abilities in the game um, and I'd like to see sort of an official ruling from Wizards if they want to track negative hit points at that point, um, where you're up and taking hits and, you know, uh, potentially there should be some sort of, uh, risk to dying. Now, the other benefit would be, I think, something like a calm emotion spell might prevent, I think that can end a rage prematurely. So it's possible that if something like that were cast, if you had a wizard that had that spell prepared, uh, then, you know, if somebody would be technically dead, then that spell would, you know, instantly sort of snuff them out. But anyway, uh, those are the Barbarian Paths. Uh, so uh, let me know what you think about the Barbarian Paths, uh, if you like them, how you feel about them. Um, you know, I think they're all decent, but overall, um, I think Path of the Zealot, even though that highest level ability is sort of... Uh, you know, to me, I consider it to be, I don't want to say game-breaking, but I do consider it to be quite powerful. Uh, to me, that's still my favorite options. Uh, I don't mind the, um, uh, the Path of the Storm Herald, but I, again, I'm not huge on the fact that you can change your, um, your abilities every level, like for Desert, Seer, Tundra. I think it would make more sense to have it locked in based off of, um, the environment that most closely matches the one that you were born to or trained under, but there you go. And the Vengeful Ancestors, I think, works really well, again, for the uh, the Tribe of Elves in Eberron that venerate their ancestors, and I think it works well for, uh, for a Dwarf as well, just where they tend to value their ancestors quite a bit. So those were the Barbarians. Uh, what we're going to do next is we're going to move on, and we're going to have a look at the Druid. Alright, so looking at the Druid now, uh, similar to the Barbarian, uh, each of these classes have sort of just some randomized charts to kind of flesh out the, the character, their design, maybe give them some things that you can use for role-playing um, opportunities. Uh, so the, Barbar the Druids have um, things like treasured items. I'm not going to read them all, uh, but again, if you want to just have a look, uh, what I'll do is I'll just show it off here, and you can just sort of pause the, uh, pause the video. Um, some of these are actually kind of neat. I like the idea of something like the vial of water from a source of sacred, uh, of a sacred river. Uh, they're just sort of things that um, they would carry with them that means a lot to them on a personal level. Uh, they also have their guiding aspects. Uh, so they're just basically elements of nature uh, that they see that inspires them to, to, to gives them sort of things they can kind of work off of. I'll just read the first one here just to give you an idea. So it's, you know, yew trees. Uh, remind you of renewing your mind and spirit, letting the old die and the new spring forth. Uh, just some things along those lines. Uh, the mentor one is probably one of my more favorite uh, aspects of this uh, this sort of uh, character background information that they have for the class. Um, and again, I'm not going to read them all out, but if you want to have a look at them, here they are. Uh, you can roll randomly, or of course you can choose them. Um, one of the things that I like, actually, is uh, option number three, which was, you know, your tutor always interacted with you in the form of a falcon, so you have never you never saw your tutor's humanoid form. I just think stuff like that's kind of interesting. It gives you some, uh, again, just some background information. But what we're really here for is to look at the Druid Circle. So there are two new circles that have been added here. So there's Circle of Dreams 
and or Circle of the Shepherd. So, Circle of Dreams are druids who remembers um, they hail from regions that have strong ties to the Feywild and its dreamlike realms. Uh, the druids' guardianship of the natural world makes for a natural alliance between them and good aligned Fey. Uh, these druids seek to fill the world with dreamy wonder. Uh, their magic mends wounds and brings joy, joy to downcast hearts. Uh, and the realms they protect are gleaming, fruitful places where dream and reality blur together uh, and where the weary can find rest. So, uh, the abilities that they get, starting at second level, uh, you get uh, Balm of the Summer Court. So, at second level, you become imbued with the blessings of the Summer Court. Uh, you are a font of energy that offers respite for, uh, from injuries. You have a pool of Fey energy represented by a number of D6s equal to your Druid level. So at second level, you'd have two of these. As a bonus action, you can choose one creature you can see within 120 feet of you, and spend a number of those dice equal to half your Druid level or less. Roll the spent dice and add them together. The target regains a number of hit points equal to the total. Uh, the target also gains one temporary hit point for each uh, die spent and you regain uh, all expended dice when you finish a long rest. So at second level you could roll 1d6 uh, and then heal someone within 120 feet of you as a bonus action uh, 1 to 6 hit points and give them an extra uh, temporary hit point on top of that. At sixth level they gain a Hearth of Moonlight and Shadow. So at sixth level Home can be wherever you are. During a short or long rest, you can invoke a shadowy power of the gloaming court uh, to help guide your respite. At the start of your rest, uh, you touch a point in space, and an invisible 30-foot radius sphere of magic appears centered on that point. Uh, total cover blocks the sphere. While within the sphere, you and your allies gain a plus 5 bonus to dexterity, stealth, and wisdom perception checks. Uh, and any light from open flames in the sphere, a campfire, torches, or anything along those lines, is invisible outside of it. Uh, the sphere vanishes at the end of the rest, uh, or when you leave the sphere. So it's just a way of basically protecting your camp, so that um, creatures have a difficulty seeing or noticing that you're there, and it makes you it makes it easier for you to I guess to see creatures that may be nearby. Uh, but again, it, it blocks things like campfire. So if you do this at night, um, it would prevent um, the campfire from exposing where you are. At 10th level, you gain hidden paths. Uh, so you can use the hidden magical pathways that some fey use to traverse space and the blink of an eye. As a bonus action on your turn, you can teleport up to 60 feet into an unoccupied space you can see. Alternatively, you can use your action to teleport uh, one willing creature that you can see, uh, or that you can touch, sorry, up to 30 feet into an unoccupied space. Uh, you can use this feature a number of times equal to your Wisdom modifier, a minimum of once. Uh, and you regain all uh, expended uses of this when you finish a long rest. And then the, the uh, last ability for the Circle of Dreams is Walker and Dreams. So at 14th level, uh, the magic of the Feywild grants you the ability to travel mentally or physically through Dreamlands. When you finish a short rest, you cast one of the following spells without expending a spell slot or requiring material components. So Dream, uh, which you are the messenger, Scrying, or Teleportation Circle. Uh, this use of Teleportation Circle is special. Rather than opening a portal to a permanent Teleportation Circle, it opens a portal to the last location where you finished a long rest on your current plane of existence. If you haven't taken a long rest, uh, or t sorry, if you haven't taken a long rest, on your current plane. The spell fails but isn't wasted, so it basically sets up the place that you would teleport to the next time. Once you, fin once you use this feature, you can't reuse it again until you finish a long rest. So each of the features here uh, rely on require uh, are essentially a once daily type of thing, uh, with the exception of the Balm of the Summer Court, which you can do a number of times equal to the dice that you have, uh, but you don't regain those dice until you finish a long rest. So unlike a lot of other feature or class class uh, options that you can regain after a short or long rest. Uh, this one here relies pretty much heavily on long rests for everything. But uh, overall, uh, as far as I'm concerned, this one's sort of an interesting concept, but I, I don't understand how the, you know, the circle of dreams, for example, 
uh, can heal necessarily. It uh, it just, I don't know, it, this one doesn't really quite do it for me. Uh, now if you guys are watching this and if you like this this feature, or this uh, druid circle, then you know by all means you can certainly you know use it and play it. Uh, I just don't quite get it necessarily the same. I mean, to me, Circle of Dreams doesn't strike me as like fey based. It, it seems more like um, you know, it, I don't know. I just, it just doesn't really do it for me. I don't quite get this one from a personal level. But you know, if you like it, then you know certainly let me know uh, in the comment section below. And maybe based off your comments, I may kind of grow to like this a bit more. But to me, this one just doesn't seem to make uh, necessarily a whole lot of sense. And I just don't like it as much. But uh, the next one I want to move on to does seem a bit more straightforward for a druid. And that is the Circle of the Shepherd. So this, I'm not going to read through the, uh, the opening here, but essentially what this does is you can create animal spirits that uh, give you certain abilities. And it also strengthens summoned creatures, uh, essentially what it does. So the first thing I want to do here is just read... Uh, speech of the Woods, so this is the first feature that you get. Uh, at second level, uh, you learn to read and write Sylvan. Um, in addition, beasts can understand your speech, and you gain the ability to decipher their noises and motions. Most beasts lack the intelligence to convey or understand sophisticated concepts, but a friendly beast could relay what it has seen or heard in the recent past. This ability doesn't grant you friendship with the beasts, though you can combine this ability uh, with gifts to curry favor from them. So you don't automatically become friendly with everything you come across, but if you come across a beast and you're able to calm it down or, or it's not necessarily initially hostile to you, it can do things like let you know what it's seen or heard recently. So if you were tracking enemies or if you were looking for something specifically, uh, it can let you know if it's seen something along those lines, which I think is actually kind of cool. Uh, also at second level, you get a spirit totem, so you can call forth magic or nature spirits to influence the world around you. As a bonus action, you can magically summon an incorporeal spirit to a point you can see within 60 feet of you. Uh, the spirit creates an aura in a 30-foot radius around that point. It counts as neither a creature nor an object, uh, though it has the spectral appearance of the creature it represents. Uh, as a bonus action, you can move the spirit up to 60 feet uh, to a point that you can see. The spirit persists for one minute or until you're incapacitated. Once during this feature, uh, or once you use this feature, sorry, you can't use it again until you finish a short or long rest. So this one you can get back after a short rest. Uh, the effect of the nature's spirit or the nature spirit's aura depends on the type of spirit you summoned from the options below. So this bear spirit uh, grants you and your allies its might and endurance. Each creature of your choice in the aura, when the spirit appears, gains temporary hit points equal to 5 plus your druid level. So it will be 7 when you, get, when you first gain this at second level. Uh, in addition, you and your allies gain advantage on strength checks and strength saving throws while in the aura. Uh, the next one here is the Hawk Spirit. Uh, so the Hawk Spirit is a consummate hunter aiding you and your allies with its keen sight. When a creature makes an attack roll against a target in the spirit's aura, you can use your reaction to grant advantage to the attack roll. In addition, you and your allies have advantage on wisdom perception checks made while in the aura. Uh, which again is a 30 foot radius around the point that the creature occupies. And then lastly, we've got the Unicorn Spirit. So the Unicorn Spirit lends its protection to those nearby. You and your allies gain advantage on all ability checks made to detect creatures in the Spirit's aura. In addition, if you cast a spell using a spell slot that restores hit points to any creature inside or outside the aura, uh, each creature of your choice in the aura also regains hit points equal to your Druid level. So it's a way of healing everybody um, else, even if you heal someone uh, specifically outside of the aura itself, which is pretty cool. I actually like that, that ability uh, a fair bit. I think that's actually a pretty decent uh, option. Uh, next, we have Mighty Summoner. So starting at 6th level, Beasts and Fey that you conjure are more resilient than normal. Any beast or Fey summoned or created by a spell that you cast gains the following benefit. The creature appears with more hit points than normal. Uh, two extra hit points per hit die. Um, so if it has three hit dice, it would gain six extra hit points. Uh, the other thing is the damage from its natural weapon is considered magical for the purposes of overcoming immunity and resistance to non-magical attacks and damage. 
At 10th level, you gain Guardian Spirit, so your Spirit Totem safeguards uh, the beasts and fae that you call forth with your magic. When a beast or fae that you have summoned or created with a spell ends its turn in your Spirit Totem aura, that creature regains a number of hit points equal to half your Druid level, so 5 hit points at the time that you gain this feature. And then we have Faithful Summons. So starting at 14th level, the nature spirits you commune with protect you uh, when you are most defenseless. So if you're reduced to zero hit points or incapacitated against your will, you can immediately gain the benefits of Conjure Animals as if it was cast using a 9th level spell slot. Uh, it summons four beasts of your choice that are challenge rating two or lower. The Conjure Beasts appear within 20 feet of you. Uh, if they receive no commands from you, they protect you from harm and attack your foes. The spell lasts for one hour, requiring no concentration or until you dismiss it. Uh, once you use this feature, you can't uh, use it again until you finish a long rest. So I, I kind of like this one. This one to me makes a lot more sense for the druid. It's all about um, using the spirits of nature um, to protect you know yourself and your allies, and also you know allowing you to summon you know more powerful beasts to aid you in combat. Uh, I like this one quite a bit, and the last thing I just want to show off here is the learning beast shapes. So this just gives you a chart of uh, which creatures that you can sort of um, change into, uh, or the creatures that you can change into based off of envi environments. So just for flavor reasons, essentially, if you grew up within, let's just say you grew up in an arctic region, then these are the beasts that you'd be most likely to transform into. And it just does this for all the different uh, terrain types. Uh, so Arctic, Coast, Desert, Forest, Grassland, uh, Hill, Swamp, Underdark, Mountain, and Underwater. Uh, again, I'm not going to go through all the different creatures, but it's just a really cool idea to give you some options that make sense for your Druid based off of where you came from. So those are the Druid features. Let me know what you guys think of those. And uh, like I said, I'm not as keen on the... Uh, the circle of the circle of dreams. To me, I, I still don't like that one. I don't think I'd ever use that one personally, but I do like the circle of the shepherd quite a bit. So now that we've talked about uh, druids and barbarians, so the, all that's left to do is look at the ranger class. All right, so just gonna look at the ranger options now. Um, so I'm not gonna go into their sort of background information here, but there's just some things that if you wanna look at, like their views of the world, uh, maybe some information about their homeland, and some stuff about sworn enemies, then you can certainly do that. Just pause the video on each of those uh, charts if you wanna read them in more detail. Uh, I wanna dive right into the archetypes. Uh, Cause it looks like there are three different uh, archetypes here that are given. Gloom Stalker, Horizon Walker, and the Monster Slayer. So we're going to go straight to the Gloom, uh, Gloom Stalker, and these tend to be rangers that are more at home in the Underdark. Um, so they're used to being sort of in, you know, darkness, in, you know, ca caverns, things along those lines. Uh, so starting off with their first features, uh, their spell lists. So they get Gloomstalker magic. So at third level, you can you learn an additional spell when you reach certain levels in this class. As shown on the table, uh, the spell counts as a ranger spell for you, but it doesn't count against the number of spells that you know. So at third level, you get Disguise Self. At fifth level, Rope Trick. At ninth level, you get Fear. At thirteenth level, you get Greater Invisibility. And at seventeenth level, you get Seeming uh, as a free spell that you learn. Uh, also at third level, you get the Dread Ambusher. Uh, so you master the art of the ambush. You can give yourself a bonus to your initiative rolls equal to your wisdom modifier. Uh, at the start of your first turn of each combat, your walking speed increases by 10 feet, uh, which lasts until the end of that turn. If you take the attack action on that turn, you can make one additional weapon attack as part of that action. If the attack hits, the target takes extra or an extra 1d8 damage of the weapon's damage type. So that'd be like slashing, piercing, or bludgeoning. Uh, so that's pretty good uh, first round ability. So you get a uh, bonus on your initiative uh, equal to your wisdom, which you'd want to have a decent one anyway because that's your ranger spellcasting ability. Uh, you get to move an extra 10 feet and you make an extra attack that deals extra damage. Uh, but it's only based off that first uh, that bonus attack that you get uh, on your very first turn. At uh, third level, you also gain Umbral Sight. So you gain dark vision out to a range of 60 feet. If you already have dark vision from your race, it's range extended by 30 feet. So if you already had 60 foot dark vision, then you would now have 90 foot dark vision. 
Uh, you're also adept at evading creatures that rely on dark vision. So while in darkness, you are invisible to any creature that relies on dark vision to see you in that darkness. So that's a pretty good way of being able to ambush things like, you know, drow or underdark races. At 7th level, you get Iron Mind, so you have honed your ability to resist the mind-altering powers of your prey. You gain proficiency in Wisdom Saving Throws. Now, if you already have proficiency in that, you instead gain proficiency on either Intelligence or Charisma Saving Throws, which is your choice. At 11th level... Oh, sorry, I just don't want the camera to fall over there. Uh, so at 11th level, you gain Stalker's Flurry. Uh, so you learn to attack with unexpected speed uh, that can turn a miss into another strike. So once on each of your turns when you miss with a weapon attack, you can make another weapon attack as part of the same action. So essentially if you miss, you can try to, uh, you basically re-roll the attack. Um, and then the last feature that they get is Shadowy Dodge at 15th level. Uh, you dodge in unforeseen ways with wisps of supernatural shadow around you. Whenever a creature makes an attack roll against you that doesn't have advantage on the roll, you can use your reaction to impose disadvantage on it. You must use this feature before you know the outcome of the attack roll. So basically before the DM um, declares what armor class they hit essentially, you can, you can use that to impose disadvantage. So that's pretty interesting. I think this works again really well for underdark races or for creatures that, or for characters that um, want to or have favorite enemies that are underdark races. So if your favorite enemy is like Drow or Durgar, then this would work really well uh, for you. If you're playing the Out of the Abyss campaign, uh, a ranger of this type might not make the most sense to be a starting character, but if you lose one of your characters before you escape the Underdark or while you're exploring the Underdark, uh, if you wanted to play a ranger, this would make an excellent sort of replacement character to bring in. So this is a, this is a pretty cool one for those purposes. Uh, up next we have the Horizon Walker. So they guard the world against threats that originate from other planes or that seek to ravage the mortal realm with otherworldly magic. Um, so they work well against essentially the ideas, things like um, demons or devils, uh, stuff along those lines. Uh, these rangers are also friends to any forces in the multiverse, um, especially benevolent dragons, phase and elementals that work to preserve life and order in the planes. So, starting off with their spells, so at third level, when you gain this, uh, if you take this archetype, then you gain these spells similar to what the Gloomstalker had. Uh, automatically, they count as ranger spells, and they don't take up the ones that you already know. So, at third level, you get protection from evil and good. At fifth level, you get Misty Step. At ninth level, you gain Haste. At thirteenth level, you gain Banishment. And at seventeenth level, you gain uh, Teleportation Circle. At third level, you gain the Detect Portal ability, so you can sense the presence of a planar portal. As an action, you detect the distance and direction of the closest planar portal within one mile of you. Once you use this feature, you can't use it again until you finish a short or long rest, uh, and you have to look at uh, the Dungeon Master's Guide, Planar Travel Section, Chapter 2, for examples of planar portals. So I'm not going to get into that here, uh, but if you're using that in your adventures, then you can use your Detect Portal ability to find them. Uh, planar Warrior, at third level you learn to draw on the energy of the multiverse to augment your attacks. As a bonus action, choose one creature you can see within 30 feet of you. The next time you hit that creature on this turn with a weapon attack, all damage dealt by the attack becomes force damage, and the creature takes an extra 1d8 damage from the attack. Uh, when you reach 11th level, uh, it increases to 2d8, so it's just a way of dealing extra damage. And it uses your, up your bonus action to do so, but again, that's a great way of dealing uh, extra damage to something. And there are very few things that resist force damage. I mean, even incorporeal undead, who resist all damages, uh, take normal damage from force. So that's a pretty good one to have. Uh, ethereal Step. So at 7th level, you learn to step through the ethereal, ethereal plane. As a bonus action, you can cast the ethereal in a spell with this feature uh, without expending a spell slot but the spell ends at the end of the current turn, so it just uses up uh, instantly. Once you use this feature, you can't use it again until you finish a short or long rest. At 11th level, you get Distance Strike, so you gain the ability to pass between the planes in the blink of an eye. When you take the attack action, you can teleport up to 10 feet before each attack into an unoccupied space that you can see. Uh, if you attack at least two different creatures with this action, uh, you can make one additional attack with it against a third creature. So if you're going up against hordes of enemies, 
this is a great way to be able to deal damage to each of them each turn. And then you get Spectral Defense at 15th level. So your ability to move between planes enables you to slip through planar boundaries to lessen the harm uh, done to you during battle. Uh, when you take damage from an attack, you can use your reaction to give yourself resistance to all uh, of that attack's damage this turn. So that's a pretty pretty neat one. I, I like this one quite a bit. Um, I don't know how much I would use this, this um, archetype, but it's still kind of an interesting idea. And if you're in a campaign where you're up against, like, um, summon demons, or the villains are trying to use magical portals, uh, planar portals, to summon creatures forward. Then this could be a really great uh, class to, to or class feature to use. The last one, though, is probably my favorite of the ranger archetypes, and that is the monster slayer. So these are uh, rangers that basically seek out things like vampires, dragons, evil fae, fiends, uh, and other magical threats. Um, so starting off with their spell list. At 3rd level, uh, they gain Protection from Evil and Good. At 5th level, they gain Zone of Truth. Ninth level, Magic Circle. 13th level, Banishment. And at 17th level, they gain Hold Monster. Again, they count as Ranger Spells, uh, and they don't require them to use up one of their spells that they would learn when they gain those levels. At 3rd level, they also gain Hunter Sense. Uh, so you gain the ability to peer at a creature and magically discern how to best hurt it. As an action, you choose one creature within 60 feet of you. You immediately learn whether the creature has any damage, immunities, resistances, or vulnerabilities, and what they are. So I think you have to choose which of those ones you want to look for. If the creature is hidden from divination magic, you sense that it has no damage, immunities, uh, resistance, or vulnerabilities. And you can use this feature a number of times equal to your wisdom modifier, minimum of once. And you regain all uses of it when you finish a long rest. So it's, again, if you're going up against something that you've never seen before, um, and the DM you know wants to keep its abilities hidden, you can use this feature to learn sort of some information about it, which is kind of cool. I, I like that one quite a bit. Uh, Slayer's Prey, starting at third level, you can focus your ire on one foe, increasing the harm you inflict on it. As a bonus action, you designate one creature you can see within 60 feet of you. Uh, the first time, uh, you, or the first time each turn that you hit that target with a weapon attack, it takes an extra 1d6 damage from the weapon. Uh, this benefit lasts until you finish a short or long rest, and it ends early if you designate a different creature. Um, so this is sort of similar to the uh, Planar Warrior, um, but it. Um, let's have a look here. Yeah, it's very similar to that, except it just increases your normal damage. It doesn't actually, uh, it doesn't actually change the uh, the damage type that it does. Uh, you also gain supernatural defense. So at seventh level, uh, you gain X resilience against your prey's assaults on your mind or body. Whenever the target of your slayer's prey forces you to make a saving throw, uh, and whenever you make an ability check to escape that target's grapple, you get to. Uh, add 1d6 to your roll, so you get uh, higher, you get an extra bonus that you can uh, add to those saving throws or grapple checks, so if you're trying to get away from, like, say, a mind flare, um, having that extra d6 may come in very handy. At 11th level, you gain Magic User's Nemesis, uh, so you gain the ability to thwart someone else's magic. When you see a creature casting a spell or teleporting within 60 feet of you, you can use your reaction to try to magically foil it. The creature must succeed on a wisdom saving throw against your spell DC, uh, or its spell or teleport fails. Uh, once you use this uh, feature, you can't use it again until you finish a short or long rest. So again, if someone's trying to get away, or if you have an enemy that's trying to cast a, uh, a spell against you or a party member, you can kind of snuff it out if they fail a saving throw, which is uh, pretty decent. And then you've got uh, Slayer's Counter. So at 15th level, you gain the ability to counterattack when your prey tries to sabotage you. If the target of your slayer's prey uh, forces you to make a saving throw, you can use your reaction to make one weapon attack against the quarry. Uh, you make this attack immediately before making the saving throw. If the attack hits, your save automatically succeeds in addition to the attack's normal effects. And I believe that's it for the, uh, the ranger. So... Like I said, I like that one quite a bit. It's not the most powerful. Uh, again, like the Slayer's Prey uh, only adds an extra D6, where the Horizon Walker 
did the extra D8, changing everything to force damage. But I just like the overall flavor and sort of feel to it. And I like the idea of thwarting like the magical abilities, being able to escape uh, effects from enemies a little bit easier, like saving throws or again, trying to get away from like a mind flare, a flare's grapple. Uh, adding that extra D6 can come in pretty handy. And the option if you're in melee with something, uh, actually, I don't think it has to be melee. Let me just go back to that. Uh, I think it's just a weapon attack. So if you have a ranged weapon, you can still uh, attempt to use that. So let me just go back to... Uh, we'll see what we have here. So use your reaction to make one weapon attack. Yeah, so that can actually be a ranged weapon. So if something's trying to like mind blast you, or dominate you, or even do something like cast fireballs or something at you, you get a free attack off against them using your reaction, uh, and if you hit, you automatically save, so you either take half damage or negate the effect at all. Uh, so, I, like I said, I, I like that one quite a bit. And those are the primal characters, so let me know what you guys think personally. Uh, again, for the Barbarian, uh, I kind of liked the... Um, uh, which was the... let me just go back to the uh, the Barbarian. I want to say that the path, yeah, the path of the zealot was my favorite of the barbarian abilities. Uh, the circle of shepherds was my favorite of the druid abilities, and the uh, the monster, whoops, and the monster slayer was probably my favorite of the ranger uh, features. But let me know what you guys think in the comment section below, which ones you like. Um, and I look forward to reading that. If you have any other questions about the particular. Uh, classes that I discussed in this video. Also, don't hesitate to ask. And um, like I said, I hope you guys enjoyed the video. I hope you found it helpful. And be sure to come back tomorrow when we take a look at the divinely inspired classes of the, uh, the cleric, the paladin, and the warlock. So until then, thank you very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed, and we'll see you next time.